Hello and thanks for joining us. Welcome to The Digital Lever by Mezzanine where we're talking digital, we're talking Africa and we're talking impact. So I'm Alex Searle, thanks for jumping in today with us and I'm really excited about the first conversation that we're going to have for the first episode we have here. Um, today we have Stephen and Leon both from Mezzanine and uh, it's actually really amazing that we're able to conduct all of this completely virtually um, across big distances in three different countries. So I'm very excited about our virtual setup and hopefully uh, a good sign for future episodes. So uh, welcome guys, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Alex. Awesome. There's lots to talk about, obviously, but I thought that, you know, given that it's the end of 2020 right now, uh, and obviously the biggest talking point is COVID-19 from, you know, what can only be described as a year for the books. Um, and without flogging too much of the dead horse, um, let's talk a little bit about the digital sort of capability that COVID-19 has been able to present to the African continent across many different sectors, industries, the different needs that, that, you know, that, that is clearly still there. And what sort of opportunities are emerging from this crisis that 2020 has presented us for? So how, in other words, how can impact be delivered in what is now the new normal? Sure, that, that, that is a fantastic question. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's answered in different layers. Um, you know, sitting in South Africa with on fiber and Stephen at home with fiber in, in Nairobi and you obviously Alex with fiber in Spain, you know, we can conduct this kind of conversation without any interruption. Um, so I think what COVID-19 has done is it's forced us all to take stock and look at the technologies that are available to us and leverage them to be able to carry on with our normal lives. Then the other layer that we, 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 we think about is, well, you know, how, how is the rest of Africa and the rest of the world um, dealing with the fact that they've got to carry on with their daily lives? And, and, and Stephen, I think, you know, probably a, a, a comment from you would, would just be to talk about how life is conducted in, for example, places like Kenya, where people can't sit at home, otherwise they don't eat. So I think, I think you know, we, we are, we've been very fortunate in that we've kind of got this first world view and first world technology at hand, I think it, where it gets very interesting is, is you know, in these other markets and uh, in, in other environments, you know, one can't just be locked up and, and, and um, you know, you've got to go out, you've got to, you've got to trade to make a living. And I think that that is, that, that has been, and, and when I talk about the other layers, I mean, one has got to be cognizant of the fact that there's a significant majority of the world that has to find a way to carry on without all the privileges that, that we enjoy. And Stephen, I mean, you were very, um, you know, when we started talking about this internally, um, you know, for, for us to understand your environment, I think, I think maybe, maybe share with us just, just how, how a large portion of the population, and even in South Africa, you know, guys are trading every day. Um, I think if you can just talk me through that, I think that will make a lot of, that'll, that'll kind of create visibility to some of the ten, the real tangible problems on the ground. Sure. Uh, th thanks, Leon and, uh, and Alex. Um, so now, it, it, interestingly, is that um, in Kenya, uh, or at least, and I think largely in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we have seen this happen in three levels. So um, if, and again, without being, um, uh, too pedantic in terms of social classes and all. Um, if you look at the, uh, the middle class, first of all, for the very longest time, organizations have tried to, um, uh, have tried to drive the work balance analogy. And then all of a sudden now we got, we were forced into this environment where you've got to do conference calls while holding your baby or while, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. all, all sorts of things. And, um, and then all of a sudden, so um, if you live in, an, in a gated community, in an estate, um, all of a sudden the parking lot is full and it's in the middle of the week um, and guys are collaborating, getting to network as neighbors and so on, trying to also keep the social distance and leverage on technology. Um, so that's the number one. And then number two is, Leon, you've talked about um, uh, what we call the working class, largely in sub-Saharan Africa. A guy who 
if he does not work today, at the end of the day, his, 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 um, his family will not have a meal. That has had a lot of impact in terms of um, how the society um, has changed because A, um, first of all, and let's be very honest about this, the middle class were worried. If, if now I, this guy does not work and he is not allowed to go and work, does not have money, that means he's gonna come for what you as the middle class, you do have, all right? So um, it quickly got people's thinking. Now we are all forced to think, how can we make sure that that guy and his family um, actually have something to eat and keep a roof over their heads. So we found organizations such as WFP um, approaching us from a technology perspective and saying, look, um, how can we ensure that um, that man in, living in, in, in an informal settlement does get some rice, does get some food and so on. And uh, again, technology played big in terms of how we can mobilize that. Um, we can mobilize uh, such resources. And then lastly, is um, the other layer is that um, largely the African culture is very, um, we interact a lot. Uh, traditionally, people wanna go to the village uh, once a week, once a month. Um, and then all of a sudden we've got shut down. Um, you, can't, you, you can't go see your elderly par parents um, because there's a shutdown or also you've been advised, uh, in, it's in their best interest for you not to take COVID to them if, because you're in the city where yeah. it's prevalent compared to the village. So how do we then leverage? All of a sudden now I'm finding myself shopping for um, a high-end laptop for my mom um, or a notepad or something. Um, so in that way, we've all of a sudden now got into this bust of where uh, we are embracing technology, not only at a corporate level, at a home level, um, at a village level and so on. Um, yeah, so in terms of um, the new normal, um, it, 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 there is a silver light. Let's be very honest. There is a silver lining into it in terms of how it, we've adjusted our lives. Of course, the, um, the detrimental part, part, of course, is that we're losing lives. Um, and how can we leverage on technology to probably um, curb that? Yeah, so I think that's the next level we need to think about. I had a quick question um, around that specifically when you were talking about the, the silver lining and the fact that technology is here and it's, and it's, and it's reached Africa, but also more importantly, it's, it's now at the stage where it's able to reach every kind of beneficiary, every stage or tier of society, depending on the program, depending on the purpose and depending on the implementation of that technology, right? So it's almost like we've entered this era of digital humanitarianism, if, we, if you like, you know, and, and that's obviously happening all over the world, not just Africa, of course. But now when you speak about the silver lining, um, we know that, and many other people will know that, many stakeholders know that, many governments will know that, but how can we accurately and sort of tangibly communicate that to these sort of last mile beneficiaries, if you like, the people on the front lines who really um, need to see that silver lining, but perhaps haven't felt it yet. I, I think um, from a Kenyan perspective, um, by default, even without in quotes, letting them know, it has actually picked up automatically. Um, everybody, when, when you think Kenyan, you think technology, everybody thinks mobile money. Uh, so by default, um, and, and, and the government did a fantastic job. Um, they zero rated a lot of the taxes that are involved in terms of transacting by mobile money. Um, so by default, without even having to tangibly let the last mile embrace the tech, uh, by default that did because um, uh, in the city, it was not uncommon. You know, you hear people saying, if I earn, for example, $1,000 a month, out of their $1,000, um, I will probably have less than um, $100 in cash throughout the month at, at best. Um, in the city, it's, the vi it's vice versa. Nine, $900 would be transacted in cash. So now we've seen that trend also now start to, equi uh, to have a, like, like a level playing field in terms of what we see in the city, in terms of what we see in the village, because the guy in the, in the village is saying, oh, this is almost free, it is safe for me, um, it minimizes the chance for me to get, uh, to, to get infected with COVID. Um, it is, uh, and all of a sudden people are finding other benefits such as it's easy to account for, because if I have $500, 
yeah. my in my pocket and I spend it in cash, at the end of the day, you ask me what I did with it, I have no idea. But if I spend it on mobile money or in, on credit card, it's very easy to say, ah, I actually did go out. I went out to the pub. Yeah. I went out to the market. I went out to the, out to the yeah. supermarket. And this is how I spend my cash. So tangibly, we have been um, subconsciously, we've been able to adopt some of these in the last mile. And then fine above that, um, I can't, of course, there's no way I probably, I, I, I would miss the chance to talk about what we've done with the government here as well. So the government has also seen, they've got this huge pot of um, subsidy or help that they want to get to the village, but you don't want to give out cash. So how do you do it? You also leverage again on, uh, on technology. So we've been able to give um, what uh, we have called uh, e-vouchers, which is simply an SMS that goes out from the government that says to a farmer, you qualify uh, for, a, for 500, for example, 500 shillings uh, of subsidy. Can you go to a participating supermarket or um, uh, outlet and redeem your voucher? So um, largely it has been conscious, but also subconscious because the need was there. We did not want to transact in cash. Yeah. We wanted to minimize uh, interaction, um, again, to curb on, um, uh, yeah. on, the, on the spread of COVID-19. Would, would you say then that, I mean, it sounds like from what you're saying that the biggest kind of tangible uh, beneficial impact that can, that can happen or that can emerge from using technology in this way, in this sort of human, humanitarian way that we've been talking about, the biggest part of it or the biggest reason why it works is is because of the the measurability the trackability of what actually goes on like you mentioned you know you go into into town with nine hundred dollars in cash whoa where did that all go it's only been one day or most of that's gone already but if you have a mobile uh, a mobile money account or if there's some way to intelligently track that there's a sort of an accountability to the user to themselves and also if you're using e-vouchering for where resources actually need to be accountably and you know transparently allocated and spent uh, then that measurability is 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 probably the most important thing leon you mentioned it. you said you know you can't you can't manage what you can't measure uh, and that's that's a great way to put it isn't it no absolutely and, and i mean you know if you've got as, as stephen points out if you've got a pot of subsidy and 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 what you want as government or as an agency is you want to make sure that that pot of subsidy gets spread as far as possible and as best and is utilized as best as possible. So the only way you can do that is by understanding the size of the problem you have, mm. because you've got your denominator. The denominator that you're going to divide it by is the pot of money. So you need to know what the numerator is. You need to be able to count everybody that's involved and be able to to work it out, or maybe the other way around. Yeah. But anyway, so so in in. in without being able to understand the size of the problem, you know, you almost start with a blank sheet of paper in terms of being able to proportion your response. So you need to understand, you need to be able to enumerate and, and, and make sense of, of the help that, that, that is required in order to be able to deliver. So, and, you know, using digital tools, um, what's amazing about Africa is Africa, to a large degree, leapfrogged um, mm. the rest of the world because we didn't go through this, and possibly in South Africa we did, through the sort of telecommunications um, roadmap where we had landlines and cables and all of these things. Yeah. Uh, you know, Africa was, was fortunate in, uh, in a certain way that we were able to jump straight to mobile. Yeah. And, um, you know, the networks in Africa have done an absolutely amazing job. Um, the connectivity in Africa, considering the size of Africa, is actually remarkably good. Yes, sure, there are spots where there are connectivity holes, but to a large degree, I mean, if one looks at the connectivity that's available, for example, in, in Kenya or in Tanzania or in South Africa or anywhere in SADC, to be fair, um, the you know we probably enjoy a, a better connectivity than than probably North America because there are you can literally get connectivity wherever you go even if it's edge or 3g or 4g uh, that doesn't really matter but one can receive an sms one can receive text messaging one can send text messaging and one can communicate and with those basic layers of communication you know it's great to be able to deliver solutions um, that tackle these challenges using that that lowest common denominator 
So yeah, yeah, you know, we're fortunate. I mean, I saw an article the other day where where um, large farms in America trying to use precision agricultural tools are being hamstrung by the fact that they don't have connectivity, and and we almost kind of imagine that that you know you kind of have this image in your mind that 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 North America has the best connectivity you can get, mm. but you know it's not cost effective to put one base station up you know for a farm that that will only cover one farm and a tractor that only yeah. goes by every you know yeah. two and three so times you a have season patchy networks yeah exactly. exactly yeah in places you don't expect to have them and so just to also qualify perhaps for some international listeners or or, or, or some who aren't exactly um au fait with what we're talking about when we're talking about communication and connectivity in africa we're really talking about the kind of mobile coverage that is afforded by the most basic of of, of, of phones, right? These often aren't smartphones. These aren't sort of like mobile network 4G, you know, streaming movies, you know, on on, on data. This is what what I believe Mezzanine calls feature phones, right? Yeah. So so c- can we talk a bit about the sort of the, the feature phone revolution, if you like, and how that is that sort of bedrock of that connectivity that Africa has and and, and has been able to leapfrog, as you say, over the last few years. Well, when you combine the feature phone connectivity with the fact that that African operators have have seen um, have seen the possibilities that 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 come from those phones, so yes, you've got basic text messaging, you've got URSSD, you've got other types of communication that you can get through the phone, and obviously voice. And and African uh, network operators have launched mobile money platforms. I mean, Stephen talked about Mpesa, which to my mind, is, is the most successful mobile money platform on the planet. Um, I'm sure somebody will comment on this video and say there might, there might be others, but to my mind, <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably one of the, it's one of the leading implementations of mobile money, uh, definitely, and definitely from, a, from, a, from a, um, an adoption perspective. So, so, you know, not only have people, uh, network operators, um, taken the communication capabilities of these very basic, very cheap, uh, very inexpensive devices. Um, but they've worked out how to add layers and layers of technological capabilities on top of that. So messaging, mobile money, um, survey type information, sending out, for example, to farmers, weather reports, sending out understanding from farmers what crops they're planting yeah. so that they can get that type of digital support and text information sent back to them. Um, even interestingly enough, for training health workers in terms of responding for COVID, you know, getting a health worker to text in saying, I'd like to find out about social distancing. And then a, a, a push voice call with a lecture that explains to that health worker exactly how to mm-hmm. maintain social distancing, how to practice um, and, and keep herself safe or then he or her safe. Um, when dealing with with these types of um, medical responses, so what's what's really been fascinating is watching the imagination of of Africans across the continent kind of been unlocked with this very very elemental part of of communication technology, which in the first world environment is not considered very fancy, but being still being able to leverage that platform and yeah. and layer technology solutions on top of that platform. Um, and I think that is incredibly commendable, and I think it is a sign of of things to come. Where you know um, we've got a colleague who keeps saying we 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 don't talk about the sexy solutions, i.e., that fancy application that does drones and artificial intelligence, but because we're trying to solve a problem that's Africa wide, we've got to work in technologies and solutions that can be deployed Africa wide. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, uh, um, yeah, and as you say, it's it's a it's a it's certainly a stroke of mastery and imagination of those operators and and probably of many other stakeholders which are probably smaller and, and and maybe more regional and locally based who make up part of that whole picture of why uh, of why it's working. And, and so another question I had, uh, um, possibly for you, Stephen, is to think about well, you know, now that we're in this new normal and all of those you know, absolute cliches that's come out of this year. Um, and we've talked about COVID-19, we've talked about, you know, the concept of digital humanitarianism and, and how some of these technologies are, are, are benefiting 
many different regions in Africa. At the same time, when well, there are all these opportunities and all these good things that have come, you know, the silver lining, like you mentioned, it like all universal forces, there's always a sort of a, you know, the other side of it too, right? And that means that, like the rest of the world, there's there's this kind of cloud of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future. I heard some some futurists the other day say that uh, even the best futurists in the world can only see up to about 400 days ahead into the future. So when you think about how not only the world is trying to manage and understand and come to terms with COVID, but also uncertainty for what's going to happen in the future. What does that picture look like for Africa? And, and how can some of the things that we talked about help to mitigate those things when it comes to making the best of an uncertain situation in 2021 and beyond? Um, Leon talked about uh, leapfrogging. Um, I really, I, I, I quite like that. A term not a term when it's um when it's used in the same sentence with Africa because um in the last two or three decades um every opportunity has for um that has come up for Africa we've leapfrogged from uh one generation and from one um from one technology to another and so on. Um if you look at um just before COVID what was starting to pick up is um first of all some throwing some stats out there Africa has got the youngest population compared to the rest of the world. Um, Africa has got the most arable land. Africa has got the not only a young population, but a very educated population as well. Um, and then all of a sudden, also, un- unfortunately, what is also uh, a downside is that a lot of these young people do not have jobs. So a lot of people are starting to warm up to um, working online, and it seemed a little bit far-fetched. Today, it is no longer far-fetched. It's, it's, it's almost becoming a yeah. norm for the younger people. So you've seen a lot of engineers. So now, even as mezzanine um, in Nairobi, as, as I seek to employ a developer, I'm competing with a company in California, in Johannesburg, in um, uh, Onslow, or where, you know, somewhere yes. completely different. Yet the engineer is right here in Nairobi. And um, so that's the exciting bit, um, is that the, the leapfrogging, the, the, the opportunity that has come up in terms, of, um, in terms of what continues to be the new normal and the silver lining is, um, is leveraging on technology and, and various bits. So um, far and above that, I just want to recap something else that also Leon talked about, is if you look at the previous uh, industrial revolutions, we have missed out. Uh, when we talk about the feature phone, my favorite phone will always be the Nokia 3310. Everybody <laughs> remembers that brick. The brick. <laughs> <laughs> the indestructible brick. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You could play Tetris on it. You could play um, that snake. Snake. Game. Snake. 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 Yeah. snake. Exactly. You could do that. I mean, and it's still the battery was not where, anywhere close to uh, yeah. diminishing. Um, and today, um, that feature phone is the one that build the, um, the, the, the thinking behind what else can we do with this phone apart from play Tetris on it. So yeah. today, even as I go out and I meet farmers, um, I don't, I've not seen a Nokia 3310, but I see a lot of feature phones out there which are very similar to that. And for that farmer, it's still very powerful because they say, this is my bank. If I'm working, if I, uh, because I've got mobile money on it, this is also um, what I use uh, to interact with my children and to communicate. These are people who used to walk miles upon miles to just be able to communicate with their family in the city. So today they can obviously do that on the team. Far and above that, now with the introduction of, uh, with, the, with leveraging more of what we call USSD, um, now you actually, even in the village, they can actually do mobile banking. Right, so not necessarily, I'm not talking about mobile money, but mobile banking, where they can simply transfer cash from their bank account into their mobile money and vice versa. These are powerful tools that now all of a sudden that we're seeing ourselves leveraging on. And then lastly, um, talking about the basic, uh, in terms of uh, the entry of the, um, um, the basic uh, Android phone, we are starting to see in Kenya where in the village, we always assume that um, they all use feature phones. We are starting to see 30% of our farmers. We've got a database of, of 1.5 million farmers, and we are seeing at least 30% of them have an entry-level Android or uh, smartphone. 
So this is an exciting time in terms of how we can deliver more services to them. Again, sticking with the word leapfrog, how we can leapfrog very quickly. That person does not need to go to, you know, through the standard um, uh, process of that probably all the standard, um, uh, what would I call it, the journey that everybody else went in terms of getting to where we are in technology. Yeah. So uh, yeah, exciting times. And, and I think, I think I mean, a lot of credit must go to, to a number of African governments who mm. realize that, that, that overtaxing these devices coming into the market um, really was slowing down the adoption. And as soon as we started seeing um, entry-level Android devices coming in at under 50 US dollars a device, suddenly there was this absolutely catalytic acceleration of uptake. Um, you know, I saw it in, in a Zimbabwean market and the Lesotho market and a couple of other markets in Africa. And, 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 and Kenya was no different. As soon as there was, there was a specific price point in shillings, I can't remember it now, Stephen. But, but as soon as that, the phones dropped below that kind of threshold price point, everybody had to have one. And, and suddenly it, it, there was an absolute sort of um, rush um, for people to, to get online. And, and, you know, to, to a large degree, you know, some of the, the, the messaging applications like WhatsApp and some of the social networks like Facebook were, were very, um, were part of that catalytic demand creation yeah. that, that everybody wanted to, to, to get on board. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see in, in a number of different African markets how you know, invariably, you know, young people go and work in the cities and, 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 earn, and earn money and, and still support people back in the village. And, you know, that, that peer to person to person money transfer was invariably done either by a visit or by, through a taxi operator before. Mobile money's changed that completely. You know, you've got um, somebody back in the village um, working on his plot of land, getting an SMS saying, oh, I've just received money from my son or my daughter or whatever, you know, that's completely changed um, a number of things for, for, for people. And it's, you know, it's kind of accelerated this financial inclusion, which, which I think still has a long way to go in Africa, make no mistake. But, you know, it's, it's incredible that in, you know, in the space of sort of 10, 15 years, the number of people that have got access to, you know, a financial identity has you know jumped up astronomically yeah awesome i mean can, okay. i mean Stephen, what is the percentage of gdp in 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 kenya that is now transmitted or remitted through through mobile money i think it's it's probably one of the highest in the world yes i, I don't have it on top of my head but i truly believe it's way more than 50 percent because um yes um actually in kenya uh, i'm not sure if it's been passed now to law uh, Safaricom was actually forced to um, to, com uh, to communicate with the government, have an SLA on mobile money because uh, the halt of if 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 money is not being transferred, it has a direct impact on the economy. So um, we're probably talking most definitely over fifty percent, but I don't have that number on top of my head. Wow. It's a staggering number if you think about all of that money moving combined. So, so wow. just add a dis disclaimer to the video, the, the statistics in this video may or may not be <laughs> any relation to the reality. You might get a letter in the post, Stephen. There we go. Um, <laughs> um, you know, for, for any people viewing this who aren't from Africa, um, Africa is a massive, massive place. I mean, it really is just from the sheer uh, size of, 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 but what's amazing about Africa is there are people everywhere. So there aren't these vast, and I'm excluding the Sahara, obviously, but there aren't these vast tracts of land. I mean, you've got massive countries like Mozambique, massive countries like Tanzania. I mean, if one was to, to fly in on a parachute and land in the middle of Tanzania, and you walk probably two kilometers in any direction, you'll encounter people. People are everywhere. There aren't this, what, what, and, I, and, and I, think, I think people in, in the first world don't really understand this because probably big commercial farms and, and can, have moved people away. But, but when one looks at the African continent, um, you, you're pretty much guaranteed to find people everywhere. So when you're a mobile network operator building out a network, um, you've got to take that into mind and take that into account. And I mean, we've seen this. I mean, I come from a network operator environment you know, we'd build a base station um, as part of a universal services um, 
deployment, switch it on. And within half an hour, we have to up, start to look at upgrading the, the, the base station because phones that were just sitting there waiting for coverage suddenly have connected to the base station mm -hmm. and are now overloading what was considered a universal services base station. So, you know, you can put network down pretty much anywhere in Africa and get customers. Yeah. And when, yeah. when mobile operators started to understand that, that not only are they going to get a voice customer, they're going to get a messaging customer, but potentially also a banking customer. So as these layers of, of, of solutions are added on top of the basic technology that we've been talking about, the basic feature phone, um, the value for the network operator is no longer about just making a voice call. Yeah. There's so many extra layers that get added onto, onto the value as they as network operators actually get from deploying technology in their markets. Well, it's the formation of a new economy, essentially, because you've got all these sort of new uh, service providers working on that basis, you've said. Yes. And, uh, and, and now they kind of depend on each, almost like a sort of a symbiosis, um, ultimately providing more value for the end customer over time. And it's interesting, networks are only now starting to think about how they kind of move up that digital value chain. Mm -hmm. um, they have been uh, bit pipes or dumb pipes or voice delivery, you know, I mean, that they've kind of lived in a voice data and SMS world for such a long time. Um, and people have layered value on top of their networks. Facebook is making money out of the network. Any network that's been employed in Africa, Facebook is making and monetizing it. Google's monetizing all of the traffic that's 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 advertising that's been driven through them. You know, the networks themselves never really get access to any of that revenue stream. So, networks are now starting to look at well, well how do we get ourselves involved in some of that tech stack? And I mean, Mezzanine is owned by a company called Vodacom, and Vodacom are now in this process of migrating their business from a telco to a tech co. Mm -hmm. So in part of that, immediately you can see that thinking starting to come forward. So I think it's very interesting to see that, that you know, the networks are starting to realize, but hang on a second, you know, if we don't start thinking about how we can create more value and deliver more value to our customers using these layers that we've been talking about, um, we're going to find ourselves cut out of the loop. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, about uh, just a little bit over 10 years ago, um, I left employment at British Telecom. And I remember our previous CEO actually had just told us that we need to stop looking at ourselves as a telco, just like Leon has said, and said, uh, we need to start looking at ourselves um, as, a, um, as an ICT company, uh, like any other company like IBM, Oracle and such. And to a lot of people at that time, it, it seemed ridiculous. And it's also around that time that British Telecom was awarded um, tender by the government to uh, digitize um, the National Health Service record um, system, whereby they wanted to link all hospitals together, uh, have records centralized and so on. Um, and BT did a fantastic job. And people started to warming up to the idea that actually a telco is no longer just a telco. And they were doing exactly what Leon was talking about, because we had the data centers, we had the networks, we had, um, we, we had the physical infrastructure. So the same thing now is actually happening. And it's, I think it's such a radical ideas that set up even the likes of Safaricom to actually stop, to start thinking and say, wait a minute, we're not just a voice and data company. We are also, we can actually do something like mobile money, which, which would have seemed so far-fetched if you talked about this maybe a, a, a little bit of a, a decade ago and say that a telco will actually do this. And now when you look at also some of the things like, again, Leon said, we're doing at Mezzanine, um, I, still, I still have to convince a lot of people because I'm, I'm primarily within the agriculture uh, vertical. I still have to convince a lot of people that I, I don't have a degree in agriculture. The, the only exposure I have in agriculture is that I'm a smallholder farmer, which is something that I do uh, for on the side. And um, when you sit with people and you say, this is actually how technology can change your agriculture de uh, department or how it can change your agricultural agribusiness uh, or as a farmer, how it can help you. Um, the people are always first taken aback because they say, you're representing Vodacom, Safaricom, Mezzanine, this is a tech yeah. company. But people are starting to warm up to that and it's exciting. And actually now I'm starting to see a shift of where people are resisting, where people are saying, can you now come up with a solution that helps us solve problem 
A, B, or C. And then it's yeah. an exciting, it's, it's an exciting place that we are going into. Um, yeah, so that, that's also, I think, something that we are looking forward to. Yeah. Move on to yeah, that. I mean, I think that the agriculture discussion is something that we must do in another, another podcast because mm. the, the population growth that we're having um, yes. is, is exceeding our ability to produce food um, in many, many markets. Um, uh, and it's not because we can't produce it and just some of the production is inherently inefficient and, and can be potentially increased in, in efficiency and productivity um, just by using some of the barest um, boosters. Um, an example is um, in South Africa and South Africa commercial farms uh, produce far more food that we can, we, can, we can eat. So we export a significant portion of, of our crops. And um, we, we were able to do that because we've built an, an economy around farming with leverage. So farming is done um, through working capital that's provided by banks. And, and yeah. that's how things happen. In Africa, that doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because um, the, the farming plots are a lot smaller in, in many cases. Um, smallholder farmers in, in a lot of the cases don't have some kind of an identity or digital identity or some kind of track record so that, 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 that they can get loans against it. And even if they do, they, they, they don't necessarily get, get loans that are feasible for them to take because the interest rates are far too high. So there's a number of areas where, I mean, as I said, we've probably got to have another discussion about this. But, but to my mind, um, you know, there's efficiencies that can be gained uh, and there's a real need for us getting those efficiencies in place. Um, for, for Africa going mm -hmm. forward. I'm quite liking it that now uh, we are starting to see whether it's the formal informal uh, sector or it is uh, private sector or public sector. I, I'm enjoying it that now they, they see us as in quotes a solution provider know that and expects us, expect us to leverage on our technology uh, to, to, to resolve a lot of the um, society problems that we have. So yeah, exciting times ahead. What I'm finding quite fascinating and interesting, COVID-19 has forced us into an environment where we're doing a lot of our day-to-day -day business over video calls like this. But what I'm really enjoying is that, that I'm able to engage with Stephen, who's, got a, who's a smallholder farmer on the side and has got a completely different background to me. But we're able to kind of leverage our individual strengths um, and particularly, it gets really, really interesting when we're starting to look at solutions that we bring into customers. You know, when one, one is putting the group together, because we're not sitting in a room together, we're, we're kind of having to, to work out, if there's three or four of us, what the best ideas are from all of those things. I, I kind of find that this, this new normal has kind of cut out a lot of the, the, the puffery, if that's probably mm -hmm. a term. And we're kind of a little bit more direct and a little bit more focused on bringing, on elevating the good. Um, yeah, maybe I've communicated that badly, but but I definitely see us. We've 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 we we as a business as Mezzanine have I think have been because of COVID nineteen and the new normal have definitely found ways of working a lot more efficiently and and delivering a better quality um, to our customers just because we've been forced to engage in a different way. Yeah, and, and it requires a sort of a, um, uh, an adaptation. A focus. Yeah, a and adapt focus. yeah, yeah, that, that, that has, you know, a, a bit of pain, a little bit of the good sides too, that maybe some people acclimatize to better than others, but certainly, you know, it, it's almost as if you're describing something that could be called a radical collaboration. You know, people kind of yes. find a way to just collaborate in the most efficient, direct, effective way and then that ultimately is actually better off anyway than maybe if we weren't in the new normal. So, yeah, silver lining. Yeah, silver lining. The other thing is office politics have virtually disappeared. <laughs> yeah. Not that there were any office politics in Mezzanine, but, but even amongst our customers, you know, there just isn't yeah. time for it anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. There'll certainly be more conversations like this in the future. Uh, that's us signing off for the Digital Lever. Thank you so much.